Well, happy Sunday, everybody, and welcome back to uh, week five of our walk through the Psalms, our Bible study through the Psalms. Uh, Good to have you back here with us, both in person and online, checking this out through uh, the YouTube. Um, We've been trying to do a lot of things over the past couple weeks and going to continue to do this with the Psalms. Um, In fact, I was putting it together, and I think we're trying to do four things all together. Number one, we're trying to learn how to study the Bible, and we've talked about that. When we study the Bible, we learn how to study other passages of Scripture as well. Uh, We're also trying to give a little information about the specific Psalms that we're talking about, and we're also trying to learn about different genres of Psalms. We aren't studying every single Psalm, so we're using these as representative Psalms that gives us more insight about different types of Psalms. But not only that, we're also trying to use the Psalms to help us develop a God on prayer life. We can use the Psalms as information and uh, examples for how we can approach God and talk to God. And because we're trying to do all four of these things, this is a really hard lesson. Uh, We're looking at two Psalms that are difficult to understand, that brings up questions about uh, why they're in the Bible in the first place, why this genre is in the Bible in the first place. And I would be very surprised if any one of us tried to pray like what we see in Psalm 79 or 109. And frankly, if someone did that from uh, the stage here at Wildwood, I would be very questioning of that, right? It would be disturbing. We'd have to wonder what's going on here. So this is a hard lesson. It could be confusing and overwhelming. And I say all that to say, let's just have a lot of grace and patience with ourselves, with this text, as we seek to understand it a little bit and uh, try to understand what we're supposed to do with it. Um, At at the same time, I think I need to point out a danger here, what you might refer to as theological minimalism or Bible minimalism. Maybe the best way to describe this is to talk about Marie Kondo. Do you remember Marie Kondo? She was really popular a couple years ago, uh, and, and her big, I think she had a Netflix show. Her big thing was minimalism, and her call was whenever you look around your house, if there is something there that doesn't spark joy, get rid of it. You remember that? Yeah. Now, as an academic, I had great problems with her because she was like, you can have no more than 10 books in your house. I'm like, yeah, that's not happening. Sorry. Uh, We're going to have an issue. But that was the principle. The idea is if it doesn't spark joy, get rid of it. (laughs) The fact is, for some of us, we approach the Bible in the same way. We want to say, if it doesn't spark joy, let's just not talk about it. Let's just get rid of it. Let's not focus on that section. And these, well, these are overwhelming. These are harsh. These are even violent sections of Scripture. Let's just get rid of them and not pay attention to them. Well, we don't have the ability to do it. If we are going to be uh, as faithful to Scripture as I think we're supposed to be, we need to recognize that everything in Scripture is useful for our growth and spiritual maturity. And so my hope for today is to dive into these and, by extension, all the imprecatory psalms and hopefully see that these are valuable pieces of Scripture and they are part of God's story. And we can look at these and say we know more about who God is as a result of looking at these psalms. And we know more about what God is doing and how God interacts with both the good and the bad. And we'll see that vengeance and vindication lies in God's hands, not ours. What I think we're going to see as we start picking through this is that imprecatory psalms help us to pray honestly about evil as we ask God to intervene both quickly and eternally. But, but let's stay here for a little while. And uh, I want to try and diagnose our uncomfort, our discomfort, because our discomfort over this genre may say more about us than it may actually say about the genre that we're dealing with here. 
Now, this may not be you, but it's something to pay attention to. And just as much as a doctor might try to diagnose a situation and notice these symptoms and say, it could be this, it might be something else. This could be a situation that we have to pay attention to. First of all, how do you feel about sin? Our discomfort here may be connected to a low view of sin and by extension, a low view of God's glory. Think about what we talked about two weeks ago. Last time we were together and we're looking at these praise psalms and we're picking through Psalm 8 where it it speaks in uh, uh, overwhelming terms about the glory of God and just how distinct and different he is for us, from us, excuse me. And it's a glorious and beautiful thing that's saying, compared to God, who am I? How, How do I relate to this situation? Well, sin has a habit of obscuring that, of hiding that difference. In fact, the fundamental sin that starts this whole thing off in Genesis 3 is two people saying, did God really say that? Maybe I know a little better than what God said. And they elevate themselves up to the status of God. And we have a danger of doing that in our own lives. And we have to recognize that sin is a big deal. And many times in precatory psalms are simply talking about acts of sin. And so maybe our issue is that we are downgrading sin, not recognizing just how harmful and disturbing sin is. But it's also possible that we may have a low view of the imago dei. Imago dei is just simply a term that refers to the image of God. And, well, we all are made in the image of God. And being made in the image of God, all humans are equal and created in his image and deserve to be treated with fairness and justice. Much of the sin in this world are simply acts against other image bearers. And so we long for everyone to be treated as image bearers of God. To have that imago Dei. It's in us, but it's in everyone. And so any act of injustice is an act against an image bearer of God. And so we can start to understand that if we aren't paying attention to that, we might not be paying attention to these acts of injustice as much as we should be. In short, we might not have fully grasped how to live for God's glory. And so that's a warning that we have right off the bat. These psalms are going to vocalize fears in the midst of injustice. In a world that is desecrated by sin, psalms like 79 and 109 and other imprecatory psalms show us how to turn to God and ask him to intervene. And I'm going to come back to this several times. I've said it already, but I like how Elizabeth Woodson says it. She says, imprecatory psalms helps us to pray honestly about evil as we ask for God to intervene quickly and eternally. So we have two psalms to get through, very different psalms, uh, but similar themes that are going on here that help us understand what's uh, going on here. So let's start by talking about Psalm 79. It says, O God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the bodies of your servants to the birds of the heavens for food, the flesh of your faithful to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. We have become a taunt to our neighbors, mocked and derided by those around us. There are two directions that we can take here in terms of context. We can look at what is said in the inscription, and we can look at what is said in the first four verses that I just read. The inscription says, a psalm of Asaph. Now, in your personal study, in the homework, you said, well, who was Asaph? Well, we talked about Asaph just a couple of sessions ago. Asaph was one of those musicians that played during the time of David. And yet you read these first four verses and it seems like it's really harsh going on here. 
Scholars disagree about what's happening here, but a majority of the scholars believe that the psalm was written by those who had been left behind after the destruction of the temple in 586 B.C., Now, that's a little confusing because it says a psalm of Asaph. The the way that scholars get around this is by arguing that just because it says the name Asaph doesn't mean that he wrote it. A psalm of Asaph may be a psalm in the style that Asaph wrote or a psalm in the tradition of Asaph, something like that. And that's confusing, I know, because at the end of the day, we don't know one way or the other. But the level of intensity that we see here in verses 1 through 4 gives us reason to believe that this would have been written by people who had seen the carnage and destruction of their home and of God's temple. They may have watched their loved ones die. In fact, verses 3 and 4 point us to blood and bodies everywhere with so much destruction that there's no one even to bury them. This is not harsh language without a cause. Something evil has happened here. And they're speaking honestly about it. See, the Psalms give us freedom to express our emotions to God. And I hope that you pick this up. God never wants us to approach him in such a way that we have to hide our true feelings. It's not, I feel bad, but now I need to change my language so that it sounds better, so that it's okay, and I'm not being true because, you know, it's coming before God. This gives us this idea that says, God, things are terrible now. They are awful. And they are expressing their emotions to God because they had nowhere else to go. In fact, it continues in verse 5. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you, on the kingdoms that do not call upon your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. Help us. O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name, deliver us, atone for our sins, for your name's sake. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Let the avenging of the outpoured blood of your servants be known among the nations before our eyes. Let the groans of the prisoners come before you. According to your great power, preserve those doomed to die. Return sevenfold into the lap of our neighbors, the taunts with which they have taunted you." O oh Lord, how long? It's a rhetorical lament. It's saying, God, can this be done now? We have had terrible things come upon us. In fact, verse 5 talks about God's jealousy, and that should remind you of the judgments that are talked about all the way back in the, De- in the book of Deuteronomy. Because let's be clear, this has been talked about. This is not surprising. In fact, it's astonishing when you pick through the book of Deuteronomy just how clear God is for it. You can look this up later. It's a fascinating chapter, but chapter 28 lays this out pretty clearly. God is talking to Moses and by extension, the nation of Israel. And he's saying, if you follow my ways, good things are going to happen to you. You're going to have long life in the land. And that's like four verses. And then the rest of the chapter, which is like 50 more verses, says, but if you do something that's wrong, I'm going to get your attention. Hey, pay attention. You're doing something wrong. And if you continue to do something wrong, I'm going to do something more to get your attention. Hey, pay attention. And it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. And God has to do, hey, why aren't you paying attention? Because they aren't paying attention. I'm probably bugging in Bible study out there. Sorry, Uh, someone else is going on. But that's exactly what's going on in Deuteronomy 28. And people are saying, yeah, we knew this was going to happen. But does it have to continue? How long? And what's the call here? 
Well, the common phrase, if you see it, for your name's sake, for your possession, all of this is driven by a desire for God's glory that his name would reign supreme. See, all these other nations here are worshiping idols. They're taunting Israel, who is meant to be God's special people, God's chosen uh, people. And the call here is for justice. In fact, verse 7 calls for that. You pick that up, right? For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. There was a promise for the land. There was a promise for a blessing for him and his descendants. But Deuteronomy didn't end with chapter 28. It said that things would get so bad that you would be carried away, that everything would be destroyed and you'd be carried away from the land. But after that happens, you'd be brought back. What's going on here is people saying, this looks terrible. Can it be done now? Can we be brought back? The fact is, even with disobedience, there would be redemption. The goal is always a right covenantal relationship with God. And so in the midst of this psalm, you see it in verse 8, there is a need for confession. Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. And all of this, for what purpose? For the glory of God's name, for his supremacy, for his majesty. He deserves to be worshipped and glorified. The psalmist is calling out his enemies, but ultimately he's calling out God's enemies. They are rejecting God. They are rejecting his laws. Created beings are taunting their creator. This should not be. And so what we're talking about here is God's law, but we're talking about confession and saying, we have not followed your law. We messed up. And so this judgment that comes upon us is harsh, but it is right. And we repent, and can we be done with this? Can we move on? Can we make things right? That's why verse 13 ends the way it does. We, your people... The sheep of your pasture will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. See, after recounting all the devastation and this confession, we have this reaffirmation of the covenant, a recognition of the special place of Israel as the people of God. They refer to themselves as sheep. We follow you, God, and we are completely dependent on you. Now, let me pause for a second and say, what does all this mean for us? See, we engage with the imprecatory Psalms through the lens of the cross. We have seen promises fulfilled in Jesus that those writing here have only glimpsed, and they wonder. Hold on to that. We'll come back to that at the end. But we need to recognize that we approach this just a little differently because of the cross. This imprecatory psalm helps us to pray honestly about evil as we ask for God to intervene quickly and eternally. How about Psalm 109? What do we have here? Well, let's look at that. It says, Be not silent, O God of my praise. For wicked and deceitful mouths are open against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. This says it's to the choir master in a psalm of David. And beyond that, we really aren't sure what time period this would happen in. These first five verses give us a little indication of what David might be going through. Essentially, character assassination, right? Attacking him in a significant way. Now, if David took time to write this, this had to be something significant, 
right? It's not like he's pulling out, dear diary, someone was mean to me today and it was no good. No, this is David. He's, put, he's been put up with a lot. He's been attacked by lions and bears. He went up against Goliath and he was chased by the king of Israel. And so he's gone through a lot. So the fact that he's writing this down here means it was significant. And David tries to do the right thing, right? Verse five tells us that. They reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. David shows them goodness and they respond with evil. That's all that we know, by the way, in terms of historical context. So we can guess, we can wonder about what's going on. It may be during one of those periods where he had lost control of the throne. We really don't know, okay? Whatever's going on, it's not pretty. And so we get to verses 6 through 20, where David asks God to show up on his behalf and vindicate him. The call is pretty clear. Stand for David. Come against his enemies. In other words, maintain the covenant that was made between God and David. See, David is speaking here in light of the relationship that he has with God. And this is really important because if we look at this uh, separate from that, it's going to seem like it's very harsh. And the fact is, it is, right? Verses 9 and following, we're talking about fatherless children that beg, beg for food, no one to extend kindness to them. It's understandable to read stuff like this and to be unsettled by the strength of these words. In fact, if you are not unsettled by the strength of these words, I have more of an issue with you, right? We, we should look at this and say, whoa, 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 whoa. Can we, really? Really? Can we just take it down a notch? But if we look at this in terms of what's actually going on here, we start to recognize that this is a relationship between God and David. And the call here is to recognize that justice and love go together. Justice and love always go together. To love someone is to stand up for them when they are disrespected. We do not take joy or happiness in these situations, and yet love and justice demands it. One of the great problems that we have in our society right now is that we have separated love from justice. And we act as if, if we're going to truly love someone, then we are not going to judge them. We act like loving someone means complete acceptance all the time and an unwillingness to note faults or failings or problems. Well, that's silly. See, sometimes the most loving thing that we can do for someone is to help them recognize the problem that they are in, the situations that they are facing. If my neighbor's house was on fire right now and they're like, oh, we're good, we're fine, there's no issue here, move along, we're good. The most loving thing that I can do is not to say, well, they say they're good, we're, we're, we're all right, so I want to show love for them by affirming the status that they have here and say there are no problems because that's what they say. There are no problems, therefore there aren't. Their house is on fire. I feel like I'm screaming a lot tonight. My apologies. My, my wife is nodding, so apparently I am screaming a lot. It's an imprecatory psalm. It was bound to happen anyway, right? No, there's a problem. What's going on here is justice and love are intricately connected here. And I'm once again not taking joy or happiness out of it, but it demands it. Repeatedly, Israel throughout its history is called to stand for the oppressed. The Ten Commandments show us how to love both God and people. And love is always fully expressed in justice. So what's going on here? It's an ultimate call of love between God and his chosen people, specifically David, through showing justice. God is vindicating his people over issues of sin. So yes, this is a shocking passage. But it's also a reminder that vengeance is the Lord's. And he will repay 
Now, what does that mean for us? Well, we are very quickly reminded that the vengeance of God was directed at us. Right? We are reminded that Romans 1 is clear. The wrath of God is directed against humankind. All humankind. And the only reason why it's not directed at us anymore is because Jesus stood in the gap. He stood in the way and he stands between us in the vengeance of the Lord. Does that mean that we pray differently? Well, to an extent. As New Testament believers, we may pray differently, but the fact remains that the enacting of justice requires the removal of evil and sin from the world. This is what the psalmist is asking for. And frankly, this is what we ask for as well. We may not feel like it needs to be this harsh, and I doubt most of us have been in a situation where it is this harsh. I I, I hesitate to bring specific current events into this, but when you think about what's going on in the world, say, in the Ukraine right now, you can start to understand the level of intensity of this language just a little bit better, right? Or if we had a fuller understanding of the level of trafficking that was going on in the world today, including in our communities, wow, this language is much more appropriate. There are people who are taking advantage of other Imago days in the world right now. People who are reflecting the image of God are being oppressed. They are being taken advantage of, sometimes simply for the sake of money, sometimes for the simple sake of pleasure, and it is wrong. If we have a high view of God and his glory and we take sin seriously, we start to say, yeah, judgment needs to come down on some people. There are clear guidelines for the punishment of sin. Whether we're talking about the Davidic covenant here or our new covenant, we all exist to glorify God and breaking God's law, whatever it is, demands repayment. Back to the passage. Verse 16 gets a little specific here. It says, he did not remember to show kindness. He pursued the poor and needy and the brokenhearted to put them to death. He loved to curse, let curses come upon him. He did not delight in blessing, may be far from him. He clothed himself with cursing as his coat. May it soak into his body like water, like oil into his bones. May it be like a garment that he wraps around him, like a belt that he puts on every day. Abused, terrified, shame, contempt. What's David's call here? He says, let what he has done be done unto him. That's actually not particularly surprising. This is a call for justice that we see echoed elsewhere in Scripture. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. In fact, this was a call, and you read about this in your homework, that is saying, well, we need a right justice to happen. If I come along and steal your cow, there's a certain amount of penalty that should happen for that. Justice should be done, but you also don't want to go too far. What is David calling for here? He's saying, look at what this guy has done. He deserves the same back to him. Justice needs to be done here. Now again, we're reading as New Testament believers. And we know that ultimate vindication comes through Jesus. But what we're seeing here is that there's a desire to hold people accountable for their sin. In fact, you looked up other passages in your homework in this section, and I'm hoping you recognize those themes of justice and care for the marginalized and a high view of God and the Imago Dei. A sin against the image bearer is a sin against him whose image they bear. When you hurt humanity, you hurt God. When you go against humanity, you go against God. But it ends well. 
a call of reliance on God, starting in verse 30, with my mouth I will give great thanks to the Lord. I will praise him in the midst of the throng. For he stands at the right hand of the needy one to save him from those who condemn his soul to death. This is a simple call of reliance on God. Significant evil things are happening. What they are, we don't exactly know in this situation. But the psalmist is asking God to intervene. It's grounded in their covenant relationship. God, you established this relationship between me and you, between you and my descendants. It's terrible now. So show up. Help. Be the God of justice that we know that you are. Imprecatory psalms like this help us to pray honestly about evil as we ask for God to intervene quickly and eternally. These are just two of many different imprecatory psalms that we see, but I think that there's some uh, points that we can draw out here that may be helpful things to remember, both for these two psalms and other imprecatory psalms. I'll say first that evil exists. The most obvious statement in the world, and yet we downplay it. Evil exists, and it is an affront to the glory of God. So our prayer should not trivialize or minimize things that go against God and his will and his ways. We need to call things out for what they are, including in our own lives. In fact, I would argue first in our own lives. If we want to grow in our lives as believers, there are two things that we need to do for our spiritual maturity. The space between our sins needs to grow, and the space between our sin and our repentance needs to shrink. It needs to become more and more compact where we are ready to call out our sins and say, God, I messed up. We cannot belittle or trivialize our sins, and we need to call out sin for what it is. If we don't, we're going against God and his will and his ways. The imprecatory psalms may seem harsh, but they are a fair recognition of the evil that exists in the world. I think we also need to remember that God's love requires his justice. We have a habit of emphasizing one at the expense of the other. In reality, if we truly understand God, we recognize that he is both loving and just at the exact same time. God's love is expressed through his justice, not at the expense of his justice. God's justice is an expression of his love, not at the expense of his love. If evil is real and God loves us, then God is going to show up and right the wrongs of injustice. May not be now. That's why the psalmist is saying how long, but it will happen. Number three. We read these psalms through the cross. As New Testament believers, we read these psalms through the cross. The model that Jesus gives us is to pray for our enemies and recognize that we have received forgiveness and thus we want to show love towards others as well. We pray for our enemies. But this does not dismiss a need for accountability. There is a need for accountability, and one thing has not changed here. Before the cross, after the cross, we leave it with God. God ultimately is one who takes care of this for us. We leave the hard things for God to take care of. Romans 12, 19, do not avenge yourselves, dear friends, but give place to God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. We got to leave it with him. One more. Number four, because of the cross, our whole vindication will come in the last days. And you saw this in your homework. You read Revelation 12.10, which speaks about how everything will fully be made right again. And when is that? 
Well, unless you take a preterist view of Revelation, it's still to come, sometime in the future. When? No one knows the day or the hour except the Father. We're going to leave it with him. He knows when it's going to happen. There will be a day when everything will be fully made right again. And so we have to trust him for that. The vindication will come. Things may be bad now. It will not always be that way. There will be a day when things will be better. The imprecatory psalms help us to pray honestly about evil as we ask for God to intervene quickly and eternally. So let's not be like Marie Kondo. It's interesting. Marie Kondo just showed up in the last week or two in my news feed. Um, she, ha like we said, has this whole point of keeping things nice and tidy. And if it doesn't spark joy, she gets rid of it. And it helped her to keep a very minimalistic and tidy house. And then she started having kids. <laughs> And uh, she's had three kids ever since she became pretty popular with this. And uh, things have changed in her house. She would readily admit it. In fact, here's what she said in an interview with CNN. She said, I am busier than ever after having my third child. So I have grown to accept that I cannot tidy every day. And that is okay. My home is messy, but the way I am spending my time is the right way for me at this time, at this stage in my life. She's realizing what's important with her. And I find this to be actually a very good parallel to what we're talking about. It may feel like we can choose and pick what sparks joy in our life when we come to Scripture. But life is not that tidy. The fact is, life is messy. Embrace it. Recognize that there are a lot of things that are going on. Life is messy and sin is destructive. But when we recognize the terribleness of sin and have a high view of the Imago Dei, we too are going to cry out to God for injustice. And we have a tool here, a good and useful tool in the imprecatory Psalms. So don't skip over them. There are hard things in the world. There are hard things to talk about. Bring them to God and ask for his justice to prevail. Let's pray about this together. Our Father, you are good. You are holy. You are just. You are righteous. And you love us. And it's hard for us to fully understand how all of those can be effectively kept in tension. But they are, and you are so beyond what we can understand. We just get glimpses of it in your word. And so, Father, help us to come to you with the hard things in our lives. Help us to be honest with you. And help us to pursue justice where we see injustice in the world, in whatever form it is, that we would call out to you and that we would bring our requests to you as the one who brings ultimate justice. And then teach us. Teach us in the way that we should go, that we could live lives of loving justice to those around us as well. But help us to be honest with you and our emotions. I pray this to you, Father, in the name of your Son, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it doesn't get particularly easier next week. We're talking about confession, okay? But it, it kind of goes part and parcel with what we talked about tonight, and it's an important one as well. So we will see you then. Have a good night.